Well, good morning. Merry Christmas. That was good. You guys are participatory this morning. That's excellent. And that'll be helpful in the sermon because you're going to be doing that a lot. Uh, my name is Todd Malone. I'm the lead pastor here at FBC, and it is great to have you here. I know we have a number of family and friends who have traveled in, and we have family and friends who are not here with us this morning because they are traveling elsewhere. So um, I will just say that we got the better end of that exchange, and we're glad everyone's here. Um, I am impressed as I look out at the crowd and see some of you who I know were not in town yesterday afternoon. <laughs> um, Advent is about waiting, and there is um, 81 years of waiting that came to an end yesterday. <laughs> Longview, for those who are visiting from out of town and wondering what in the world we're talking about, Longview High School won the state football championship yesterday. And um, <laughs> that's a big deal anywhere, but in Texas, that's a Texas sized big deal. Um, absolutely. Um, I love that last song we sang O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Because the name Emmanuel means God with us. And that's what Christmas really is all about, is God with us. And that's going to be what we're talking about this morning. God is with us. Now, we need to start with an important question. Um, who knows what this is from? Charlie Brown. Okay, now, excellent. See, I told you this is going to be a group participation sort of sermon this morning. Uh, who here has seen it? Uh, the rest of you can confess your sins later. Um, so if you've seen it, you know what happens, right? Charlie Brown is supposed to direct the kids' Christmas program. And as a part of that, at one point, he is sent off to go pick out a Christmas tree that will be used for the program. And the tree that he picks out is the one that's on the left. Let's just say that doesn't inspire confidence in a group of kids that already had absolutely no confidence in him whatsoever. But here's what's interesting. Although all the kids made fun of him, there is a moment in the special where the kids turn. And they actually decide they're going to love this tree and they're going to decorate it. And what it turns into is the tree on the right. Now, you may know this about our family because I share this freely and often and probably every year about this time. But uh, for those of you who are visiting, a fair warning, my family reenacts this scene every year. Uh, we've actually been a little bit slack the last year or two, but but we have a long tradition in our family of reenacting this scene, and here's how it, how it works. All the kids, grandkids, everyone, we descend upon the Christmas tree lot, and we scatter, and we all look for the best Christmas tree we can find. Um, Douglas firs have the inside track, because I grew up in Oregon, and that's what we always had. So if someone finds a Douglas fir, that's usually going to be the winner. And once everyone has agreed upon what's the best tree, we as a family circle around it. Yes, we do this at Lowe's. We do this wherever. And we hum, hark the herald angels sing, complete with throwing back our heads like they do in that picture. I want to give you this gift right now. If you are looking for the single best way to traumatize your teenagers, <laughs> this is it. They loved it when they were little. And then they became teenagers and realized that everyone at Lowe's was staring at them. And now that they have their own kids, guess what they're doing? 
It's called payback. Have you ever noticed that the Christmas tree in this story mirrors Charlie Brown's life? It's really fascinating. Charlie Brown starts off as someone who just messes everything up. He can't succeed as the director. The one thing he's asked to do is to go get a Christmas tree, and the tree that he picks won't even hold up one single ornament. He messes everything up. But then, at the end, we discover that all he needs is a little love to be transformed into something beautiful. See, I think there's a reason that this special has become a classic. And I think it's because we connect with it in a very special way. We can relate to Charlie Brown wanting to be loved. We know what it feels like to mess everything up and to feel like we can't do anything right and to feel like the entire world is laughing at us. We want to go from being the scrawny tree to something that is lush and beautiful and loved. And the question is how? The question is how is that transformation possible? And Christmas answers that question. We've been in the short series on Advent, which is the first four weeks leading up to Christmas. We started in the Old Testament. We looked at the promise that's in the Old Testament that God would bless the entire world. And as the Old Testament progressed, we see more and more what that blessing is going to look like. And by the time you get to the prophets, you see that there is a king who is going to come. And under the leadership and rule of that king, there is going to be perfect protection, perfect provision. There is going to be peace within all of creation, with one another, with God, and within ourselves. We saw that people in the Bible lived waiting for that day to come. And the beginning of the fulfillment of all of those promises was the day that Jesus was born. Because Jesus is that king. Christmas is a celebration. It's a celebration of the fulfillment of those promises that they began to unroll. That they began to develop with the birth of Jesus. And now we wait for those promises to, to be complete. We live as we saw last week, in an in-between time. We live in between Jesus' first coming, where the promises begin to unfurl, and we live waiting for his return, when all of those promises will be complete. And yet, even as we wait, we are invited to participate in the blessings of those promises. The title of this series has been, The Meaning is in the Waiting, and the reason we titled it that way is because our culture says waiting is a waste of time. But as we wait, we discover that God is at work to transform us. The people who lived before Jesus waited for his birth. And we learn a lot from them about how we are to live as we wait for Jesus to return. We live for the day when our waiting will be over. When we will experience the perfect provision and protection and peace that every one of us longs for. There are important truths in today's passages that the Coleman family read that are really helpful for us as we wait. We need to understand the nature of the gift that we were given that first Christmas. And when we really grasp what God was doing that first Christmas, it will completely change us forever. And the first truth that we need to grasp is that Christmas is all about a gift from God. Do you ever catch yourself thinking of God like Santa Claus? Right? God's put everyone on one of two lists. You're either on the naughty list or on the nice list. And if you make the nice list, then God's going to give you nice things and do nice things for you. But if you're on the naughty list, watch out. You're in trouble with God. And you see, if that's your view of God, then it becomes incredibly important for you to do everything that you can to get on the nice list and stay on the nice list. And our picture of God 
And that scenario is something like God sitting in heaven, keeping score, trying to see who is good enough for him. It's a lot like me trying to follow the Longview football game yesterday on Twitter. I did nothing to affect the outcome of the game. All I could do was wait for scores to be updated. And sometimes that's how we think about God. He does nothing to intervene, to change what is happening in our world, and he is just sitting back watching for scores to be updated on how we do. But Christmas gives us a very different picture of God, and it's tucked into the question that Mary asks in verse 34. How will this be? Mary understood that she did not meet the great criteria for what God wanted to accomplish. What Mary is asking in her question is, God, if you've got a list, if you've got a list of people who would fit the profile for this job, I'm not on the list. She doesn't meet the most basic requirement. She doesn't have a husband. She doesn't meet the standard. The score is so stacked against her, there is not a chance that she can fulfill the criteria and win. But God's answer back is basically, Mary, this isn't about you. This isn't about what you're doing. It's about me, and it's about what I'm doing. Do you notice in the very first sentence in today's passage, it tells us that God is the one who took the initiative. He is the one who sent Gabriel, the angel. He is the first one to act. God isn't passively keeping score. He is at work. Everything in the Christmas story begins with him. God drives this all the way through the story. Jesus will be born. Why? Because God is going to work. He will form the baby Jesus within Mary so that Jesus will be called the Son of God. And isn't it interesting that even here the word holy is used for him? The word holy really just means set apart, different from the common, different from the norm. Jesus is radically different, radically set apart from the very beginning. Why? Because of the work that God did to bring Jesus into the world. See, if we think the Christmas story actually begins with Mary, we miss the point. The Christmas story really has nothing to do with what Mary accomplishes or anyone else accomplishes. It's not about what list we're on. It's not about the fact that there are things that we're supposed to accomplish. It's about the fact that nothing is impossible with God. The story of Christmas is the story of what God does precisely because we couldn't do this on our own. See, if we think of God like Santa Claus, we will think that the Christmas story, like every story we tend to tell about God, really begins with us. We will think that it's about getting on the right list. The Christmas story is not about God sending Jesus because we were on the nice list. It is about him sending Jesus because we were on the wrong list and couldn't do anything about it. More group participation. Who knows what this is from? Rudolph. Outstanding. Yes. And uh, who are these characters? Where, where do they live? Island of Misfit Toys. And why do they live there? Because nobody wants them. Because something is wrong with them that they can't fix. Something is wrong with them that makes them seemingly impossible to be loved. And we don't want to think of ourselves as being on the island of misfit toys. But that's part of the message of Christmas. We want to believe that, of course, Look at who we are. God's going to put us on the nice list. But deep down, we know, we know that there is something wrong. There is a reason that our relationships go so badly, and it's not always the other person's fault. 
We know that some of the things that we say and do and think are cruel. We know that some of the things that we say and do and think are selfish. We know that if God is really, really perfect, if it truly is the case that he is completely just and completely good, that there is no way we live up to his standard. There is no way that we can get off that island. We are too broken. The first Christmas should raise in us the exact same question that it raised in Mary. How is this possible? How is it possible for God, who sees every dark secret about us, to love us so much that he wants to be in relationship with us? How is it possible for a broken person like me, like you, to live in relationship with a perfect God? And the answer is in the kind of gift that God gave. The gift is not just a gift from God. It is a gift of God. See, there's another way that we can think that God is a lot like Santa Claus. Right? He drops in once a year. Leaves us either something good or something bad. Grabs a few cookies. And then takes off again. And we have absolutely no idea what he's doing while he's gone. Christmas gives a very different picture of God. God doesn't drop off presents and leave. Maybe the most amazing thing about Christmas is that God is both the giver and the gift. It's easy for us to miss in this passage because we don't have the same figures of speech that they did. In that culture, if I were to call you the son of laughter, it would mean that you have the qualities of laughter. You would have a sense of humor. You might have a great laugh. You might be funny looking and make other people laugh. If I called you the son of Moses, it would mean that's because you're just like Moses. Jesus is called the son of the most high, the son of God. The point that is being raised in this passage and gets developed throughout the New Testament is that Jesus has all the qualities of God. Jesus is God in human flesh. Verses 32 and 33 make sure that we don't miss the point. If you've been with us for the past few weeks, this language is going to sound familiar to you. This is the king promised by the Old Testament. The king will reign over God's people forever. And as mentioned earlier, his kingdom is the place where all needs are met, where we are perfectly safe. We are perfectly at peace. Since the king isn't just a normal human king, but God himself, God will be at the center of that kingdom. Everyone and everything will relate to God exactly like they were designed to And it's like the hub of a wheel. When all the parts are perfectly aligned with the hub, they're also perfectly aligned with one another. The point is that God doesn't just want to drop in and leave. He's not a drive-by God. Christmas is about God wanting to be in relationship with us. So he takes the initiative and he comes to us and he wants to stay in relationship with us. It's not temporary He stays in relationship with us forever. And that's what heaven is. Heaven is the perfect, eternal relationship with God. That's what makes heaven amazing. The reason heaven will be a place of perfect peace and provision and protection is because we will be in perfect relationship with God. You see, if you think God is like Santa Claus and he just drops in, if you think he's just kind of a drive-by God, then what do you think God really wants from the relationship with you? What you'll tend to think is that God is only interested in being in a relationship with you when it's convenient for him or when he wants something from you. You Guys know what movie this is from? (laughs) Muppet Christmas Carol. Who are the two characters? Scrooge and, see, now that's where it gets tricky. Um, It's Scrooge 
and as played by Kermit, as played by, I think in this movie, it was Frank Oz. Um, uh, yeah, it's Bob Cratchit. That guy. Bob Cratchit or Kermit. Who's the mean guy? Scrooge or Michael Caine? Have you ever thought about what makes Scrooge mean? And what makes Bob Cratchit nice? What makes Scrooge mean is he doesn't care about people. He's mean because he uses people to get what he wants. He only cares about them for what they will do for them. For him. But Bob Cratchit's just the opposite. He thinks people should be loved just because they are people. He even thinks that Scrooge should be loved and spoken well of. And a lot of us think God is a lot like Scrooge. That he's a sort of drive-by God that only shows up when he wants something from us. Do you think that God just wants a relationship of convenience? That he really just cares mostly about what he gets out of it? Or do you think that God loves you and wants to be in an eternity-long relationship with you? The baby born in the manger was God in flesh. God who loves us and wants to be with us. He came to be with us that we might live with him. The gift that first Christmas was more than God sending a great man. The gift that first Christmas was God coming himself to pursue a relationship with us. Christmas is a gift from God. It is a gift of God, and like all gifts, it requires a response. It's a gift for us to receive. That was true at the birth of Jesus. Mary gets this announcement that she will have a son, despite the fact that she's unmarried, and she has to respond to that. Think about what that might have cost her. As far as she knew at that point, her fiancé, Joseph, was just going to terminate the relationship. She would have been subject to a type of public humiliation in that culture that we can't even relate to. In fact, the Jewish laws of her day allowed for the death sentence for a case like this. Girls were given in marriage, usually at the age of 12 or 13, precisely to avoid this type of scandal. Mary has to respond to the future that's being presented to her. And she had every reason to turn down this gift. But she says to the angel, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. It's one of the most remarkable statements in the Bible. See, the word servant had a very specific meaning in that culture that we might miss today. Mary was basically saying that she was voluntarily putting herself under the authority of the Lord so the Lord could do with her life whatever he wanted. She tells the Lord to take her life, do what he wants, despite what this is going to cost her. That is how she received the gift that the angel announced. And it's the model for how we receive the gift that God offers us. We receive the gift by trusting Jesus with our lives, just like Mary did. And we are all trusting in something. We are all trusting in something to make life work. We are all trusting in something to feel valuable, to feel lovable, to feel less like the Charlie Brown scrawny tree, and to feel more like the full th thriving tree. Isn't it funny how much we make Christmas a test of our acceptance and how much we're loved. We compare the gifts that we get with the gifts that others receive. We spend a lot of time worrying about whether someone that we give the gift to will like it because we're worried that that might be an indication of whether they like us more or less. We live so much of life measuring our approval our acceptance, and trying to earn more. And in the same way, we are trusting something to gain God's approval. We are trusting in something 
to take a life that feels like the pitiful Charlie Brown tree and turn it into a lush, thriving tree. We are trusting in something to put us on God's nice list. Our natural inclination is to trust ourselves. Our natural inclination is to trust our ability to be a good person, to do good things, to be well-liked. We tend to think that if we can tip the scales far enough towards doing good things, then God will put us on the nice list and accept us. But here's where we go back to Mary's first question. How is this possible? How can a broken person be good enough for a perfect God? You can't. It's impossible. Well, it's impossible for us. But nothing will be impossible for God. And that is why God gave himself as a gift. Only he could be perfect enough. See, he was born as a human because only a human could pay the price that humans owed for their sin. But a human could never, ever be good enough for a perfect God. And so Jesus came both fully human and fully God because only then could he pay the price that we had to pay. Receiving the gift happens by switching what we trust. It's really that simple. We acknowledge that we are so broken that we cannot fix ourselves. We can't be perfect enough for a perfect God. Receiving the gift of Christmas starts with accepting that reality. But then we go to God and say, I want forgiveness for being this way. Instead of trusting myself and my efforts to tip the scale and make things good, I trust that Jesus' perfect life and death on the cross were enough to make, my, to make me right with God. Instead of trying to tip the scales towards the nice list, I accept, God, that you just put me on the list. Because through Jesus' death and through his perfect life, all of his goodness gets applied to me. And then the same power that raised Jesus from the dead starts to make our lives new. It starts to turn us from that Charlie Brown tree into something that thrives. Most people who grew up in the church, including me, struggle to have the truth of this statement really sink in. We start out understanding, believing that our relationship with God is totally based on Jesus' perfect life and his death for me to pay the price for my sins. But somewhere along the way, we start living like God expects us to keep ourselves on the nice list. Use this Christmas as a reminder. God pursued you when you were broken. God pursued you when you were on the island of misfit toys and you had no way to get off. And he knew every single thing about you that you will ever do, even then. Remind yourself this Christmas that God isn't going anywhere. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He continues to love you. He continues to live in relationship with you. Why? Just because he loves you. The story of Jesus' birth makes a point. The point is that Jesus' birth was unlike anything that had ever happened before or ever happened since. God took the initiative to give an unimaginable gift himself. And the reason that he did it was so that we might have life with him now and forever. And that's the point. The gift of Christmas is God giving himself that we might live. Charlie Brown Christmas special. Do you remember why it was that the kids' attitude was changed? Their perspective was changed? It's because something that Linus said. Linus reminded them of the real meaning of Christmas. Linus reminded them that Christmas was all about God giving himself for us that we might live. And when the kids remembered that, it changed them and their perspective. If I could give you a gift this Christmas, it would be this. 
It would be the assurance that God loves you. It would be the truth to really sink in that you don't have to hide from God or play games with God trying to impress him and gain his approval. He already sees everything about you that you want to hide. He sees everything that you have ever done, are doing, or ever will do. And he looks at you and he says, I love you. That is why God gave the gift of his son. All of us need to allow that truth to sink in a little more this Christmas. We have some suggestions for how to do that. You will notice on this handout that you received, at the very bottom there's a tear-off. And in that tear-off is a place for you to respond or to share with us how you want to respond to the gift of Christmas. And here are some ways that we're suggesting. We always start with prayer. Ask God to help the truth of Christmas more and more sink into you. It doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. It doesn't matter if you grew up in church or have never walked into church before in your life. God wants to answer that prayer. Go to him and say, let the truth that I am broken but loved sink in. There are discussion questions, and we just encourage you to discuss those with someone else. Spend some time going back and reading through Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38, and just pay attention. What do these verses say about who God is? What do these verses say about how God sees you? What do these verses say about what God is doing, what God is up to? And then last, and this is most important, if you have never said, I want to stop trusting my efforts to tip the scales and get on the nice list, so I can gain God's approval. And I want to just trust what Jesus did for me. This is really a good time to do that. And we love for that to happen for you. How do you go from being the scrawny tree to being the thriving tree? It's through Christ. And it's through the gift of Christmas. Let's remember that. Let's focus on that and remember that as we celebrate Christmas in the days ahead. Let's close in prayer. And as we close in prayer, why don't we stand? And I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward. These folks who are coming forward are here to pray with you, no matter what you're facing. If you are struggling with loss or grief, if there is someone from your family who is missing this year and you just want someone to help share that burden with you, that's what these folks are here for. If you are someone who said, I've spent my entire life trying to earn my place on God's nice list and I can't do it, these folks want to talk to you about that because there is a way for you to be there. Would you pray, pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you love us and you pursue us. That you, that first Christmas, sent your son to be fully human, fully God. We can't understand it, but we know it's true. And you did that because you loved us. Because you are pursuing us. Because you want to be in relationship with us because you're not going anywhere. And Lord, we thank you for that. But we pray, Lord, that this Christmas would be a season that we are reminded that we are both broken and loved. And we thank you for that. This in Jesus' name, amen. So let me leave you with this thought. God is both the giver and the gift. That is who our God is. So when we leave here, we leave here embracing the life that God has for us this Christmas. You are dismissed.